Sunday school. We're going to start as we normally do with our prayer requests. I'm going to get we have I'll just teach continue you. to pray for church oh, growth yes. spiritually, numerically, financially. Uh, pray for our country and our leaders, economic situation here, but also the situation in uh, Ukraine. We want to pray for our national revival, which of course begins with God's people. Uh, the Hill family is uh, the family that contacted me out of California. I'm really not sure how they are associated with the church or if ever. Uh, he just found the church and asked me to pray for their family. Uh, and as we've been praying for them for several months now, and as we go along, I learn more about the situation. They've been in marriage counseling and separated for about two years. And... Uh, the uh, am I dead? The uh, anyway, oh, there we go. The uh, they are to get together for marriage council on Monday and uh, basically see if they're on the same page that they still want to save the marriage. The husband is clearly, or at least he sounds it in the emails, committed to the, to the process of restoration and reconciliation. And uh, I suppose if she's going to marriage counseling with him, then she's at least partially committed to that. But then they're supposed to actually ask the question on uh, Monday there. Um, still praying for lots of people in the church carry a high degree of stress with their jobs. Uh, I think this craziness with the young, with the economy is kind of putting the stress on all of us. We have unspoken. We have a list of backslidden and lost friends. We have a list of help. Uh, Shady Martinez has us. Uh, we are. Plummeted 
perhaps as far as the Israelites in our lesson this morning, but we are definitely in need countrywide of a touch from on high, Lord. I know that uh, Europe is in need from a touch from on high, Lord. And again, I know that starts with your people. And there are churches around Brother Woody, uh, Brother Taylor, uh, the church there in Stuttgart, Brother Raydane's church out at Amspot, Lord. And, uh, many churches uh, besides those ones with which we are familiar, Lord. There's Corey Myers in Spain and, and uh, uh, Zolan Kish in, in Hungary, Lord, and so many others. I just pray that you start a revival in, in each of them, Lord, that would spread to the community of the country. We do pray that you would protect the Ukrainians. Uh, somehow, Lord, we, we don't know how, but somehow we ask that you turn uh, this whole yucky situation to your honor and your glory, Lord. We do pray for uh, the Hill family as they uh, are trying to reconcile their marriage, Lord. We pray that you would work, work there uh, something similar or perhaps even better than you did in the Hamilton family, Lord. We do pray for the Nisley family, Lord, as Timmy was blindsided with uh, just strangeness there, Lord. I pray that you would work there in that situation Again, I confess to you, I don't really know how to pray for them, but we put them in your hands uh, as best we can, Lord, trusting you to do what is best in that situation. We do pray for the stress, Lord. I know that stress can can trigger physical health problems, Lord. I know that uh, many of us are facing a high degree of stress, Lord, whether it be from our jobs or, or from the economy or perhaps some of these marriages that we mentioned, Lord, there's stress associated with that. Um, Lord, I know Michelle is under a bit of stress right now, and I just pray that you would um, strengthen all of us who are facing that stress, Lord, and help us to just turn that stress to thee, Lord. Um, pretty hard for us, humanly speaking, Lord, to release that to you. But I pray that you would help us to obey uh, the sentence there or sentence fragment there uh, following 1 Peter 5 and 1 Peter 5, 7, Lord, where we are not really commanded, but it is assumed that we would just cast all of our worries and all of our cares upon you, Lord. I pray you would help us to do that in, in reality, Lord. Everybody from me in the front to whomever's in the back, Lord, Dan, and on all the way back to Phil and the teenagers, Lord, teenagers experience stress too. I pray that you would help us each and every one to turn that stress to thee. Lord, we do pray for these uh, uh, backslidden friends, Lord. We could name so many, but you know them all. We don't want to cause any offense to drive someone further from thee by uh, live streaming their names, Lord, but you know them. And we ask that you work in their lives, Lord. Some have uh, overt and obvious sin that's controlling their lives, and some of them appear to be outwardly good people, but they're just not following you. We pray that you would work in their lives this morning. Lord, I pray for all of these different help requests, Lord, Shaley and McKaylee and Rainer and Inga and Eric and Eileen and Phil and John and Lon and I know John and Lon are exhausted or were yesterday. Uh, I pray for these uh, chronic health issues, Lord. We do praise you for the good report my mother-in-law got this week. Uh, and pray for Caroline's friend and Iris Cannon, Lord. Just work in our midst, Lord. We love you. And again, we pray all of these things in Christ's name and for Christ's honor alone. Amen. All right, let's turn to Judges chapter 8, and then we will back up and look at Judges chapter 7. I have preached often from Judges chapter 7, uh, but today I want, to, I want to read you one bit of one, actually I'll read the whole verse, in, in uh, Judges chapter 8, and, and I pray that what I have uh, for you this morning, uh, it's not new, it's not anything that's never been preached before, 
but I think it is something that would be an encouragement to us all. Good morning, Cecile. Good morning. Uh, in, in Judges chapter 8 and verse number 4, the Bible says, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, and the 300 men that were with him, notice this phrase, faint, yet pursuing. Now, most of you probably know the, the, uh, the story uh, that goes with this, which we will look at in a second. But, you know, sometimes you may look at somebody and you may say, uh, well, they don't look tired. I may look at Jeremy's life and I may decide that J Jeremy doesn't have any stress. I may look at Otis's life and I may think, boy, Otis has got it going on. He's got nothing to worry about. You know, we, you can say you don't, but we all do that, right? We all look at somebody else's life and, and, and we think, well, they just they don't understand what I'm going through. We all, we may not sing it, but we all tend to, including the preacher. The preacher has pity parties sometimes, you know. Uh, my dad used to look at me and go, you know what that is, boy? Say it out loud. With the world's tiniest violin. Playing you a sad, <laughs> sad song. That's what my daddy would say, right? Uh, <clears throat> we all have pity parties. You know, there was the the song on um, on Hee Haw, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, <laughs> Despair, and Agony on Me. You know, they'd all be sitting around telling some sad story. Well, it really was a sad day here for the Midian, I mean, for the, the Israelites. They had, they had turned their backs on God. See, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times when we're in a bad situation, we're just proving Galatians 6 true, right? Galatians 6 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. There's sometimes we're reaping what we've done. And that's really where they were at this moment. They turned their backs on God. They got so far away from the Lord that the Midianites and the Amalekites, which were the enemies of God, were coming in. And just about the time they had the, 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 the crops planted and the, those young green blades had popped through the soil, then the Midianites and the Amalekites would turn out their stock and, and have their camels in there. It tells how many camels they had and how many uh, sheep they had and all this stuff. And they're, they're eating the crop. The enemy was without number, the Bible says. Now Gideon, he was the least of his house. He was no warrior. I've, I've, I've preached the text before from a different perspective than I'm going to preach it today. But you know, Gideon is hiding. He's in a wine press, so there's walls around him, and he's threshing, but you need the wind to thresh, so he's having to blow on it to, to, to thresh it, right? He's throwing trying to blow the chaff away because he's afraid to be seen with what little he has to eat, probably afraid not only that the enemy might get it, but that his comrades who are starving to death also might get it. But if God calls us, if you're saved this morning, say amen. Amen. Then we're on the winning side. Okay? We're fighting from a victory. We're not fighting to a victory. What victory are we fighting from? You tell me. We're fighting from a victory. What victory are we fighting from? Victory of Jesus. Victory of Jesus. He said on the cross, it is finished. I don't have to do anything to, to earn my salvation. I'm fighting from a victory. What is the victory for us today? This is the victory. Even our faith that overcomes the world, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 4. You know, most every Baptist I know can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. The faith itself is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But then we get to the next verse. It says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk therein. God's got something for us to do. Now, it's not about rules, but it is about realizing that we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, Romans 8, uh, 28, you probably all know, 
we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 29, for whom he did foreknow. So before he said, let there be light, he knew who would be saved. And whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It's not about following rules and regulations. It's true. But if I'm trying to be conformed to his son, my life's going to change. Gideon was promised the victory. And I don't know who said it, but it's a very wise statement. What God promises in the daylight, you can count on in the darkest of night. I've never been tired in the way. You know, the New Testament, called, we call ourselves Baptists. The word Baptist, other than John the Baptist, is not found in Scripture. But we were called Baptist or Anabaptist, another baptism by our enemies. What were the Christians called in, in Acts? Those of the way. I grew up singing a song. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way road is clearer for her. I'm in the glory land way. I've never been tired of the way. But I think if you'll be honest, we get tired in the way. Jesus said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. What is significant about finding pasture? Rest. I'm sorry, what did you say, Obi? Rest. Rest, he said. All right, what did you say? Same thing. Same thing. I think we could say rest, but, you know, I learned about, about sheep. And the Bible calls the sheep of his pasture, right? Goats will, goats will get out if they have everything they need. They'll just get out. I've not seen it, but I have friends and family who've raised goats, and they tell me that a billy will take his legs and lay them across the top of the fence, and the nannies will run up his back and jump over the fence. Even though they have everything they need in here, they're bored with being in here, they want to get out there. A sheep typically will not get out of a pasture if it is satisfied, if it's protected, and it has everything it needs to eat, it's not going anywhere. When they get out, I've had sheep get out. My sheep got out because the neighbor's dogs were bothering my sheep, and so they ran to get away from the dogs. But if they have any, if they have what they need eat to eat, and they're protected, then they're satisfied. They're not going anywhere. But look. There is a reality, um, all that's introduction, I'm finally getting to what I want to teach you this morning. There is a reality of faintness if you're in God's service. Faintness, tiredness. The Bible says faint yet pursuing, all right? You're going to get tired. You know Galatians 6, 7 to 9, but uh, I started with it. Whatsoever you sow, that shall I also reap. But what does verse 9 say? We shall reap if we faint not. Right? But there is a weariness in service. Last week I was out or up until midnight every week, every night this week on God's business. All right? <clears throat> now, I can say, and I do, it is more pleasurable to be busy about the Lord's work than to be busy about something else. And yet you know that there's a tiredness of being out late every night. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. The Christian life is more than just coming to church. Okay? Some people I have met in my, thankfully I don't know of anybody, at least in our what we might call our inner circle here at the church who holds that belief. But some people seem to feel like that if we just come to church, then then, then that's good. You know, you got you got a crowd that they, they sit and they soak up the word of God 
but they're not giving it out. What happens if, if you have something good, whether it be uh, tea? If you, have, if you have some good southern sweet tea and you leave it out of the refrigerator, what happens to it? It spoils. Okay? Because that sugar will sour some kind of way in there. You take a drink and you'll, that, that ain't right. All right? <clears throat> But you got some people, again, I'm thankful that I don't think we have anybody here, that they feel like you just come to church and soak up the Word of God, even though they're not, they don't have an outlet for it, that's all they need to be. But 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 58, talks about being unmovable in the, the, the work of the Lord. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatsoever we, we find to do, do it with our might, okay? There's, there's, some, there's some tiredness that comes from that. Some people think separation is the epitome of the Christian life. Okay. Is it? When we say separation, what do we mean by that? Not living like the world that we live in. That's exactly right. Um, Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Okay? Hath not where to lay his head. It's actually the words of Scripture. But look, Jesus got tired. In John 4, 6 and Mark 38, he was tired. Even though he, he opened the eyes of the blind, he stopped funerals, he made the lame leap. Think of all the different things that he did, and yet the Bible says in John chapter 4 that he was tired and he sat down on the well, right? In Mark, uh, he was tired and he was asleep in the hinder or hinder part of the ship. So he's in the back of the sh ship asleep, but then he got up and calmed the storm. You, you cannot serve Christ. I cannot serve Christ and not get tired in the way. But what, what's the, the answer there? This, not really the end of the sermon but, or the lesson, but in Isaiah 40, 31, probably most of us know this verse. They that wait upon the Lord. I do want you to know he's not talking about Waiting on the Lord like you might wait on a bus. He's talking about waiting on the Lord like serving the Lord. Okay? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So obviously they got tired, right? They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It doesn't say we won't get tired if we got tired if we didn't get tired, we wouldn't need to renew our strength. But we can serve the Lord without fainting. So what are the reasons for the reality of faintness? Does everybody understand that you can get tired in the way? Everybody, everybody on the same page? All right. So what are the reasons for faintness? I hear pastors talk about, well, I had a good family, but they just don't come anymore. <laughs> We don't have to stress out. We don't have to quit on the Lord. We can't. What did Paul say? From a jail cell, don't let that escape you. When Paul said, I, I'm forgetting those things which are behind, and I'm pressing towards the mark, he's sitting at a jail cell. Do you know what happened when he exited that jail cell? They cut off his head, and he went to heaven. From a jail cell, he said, I press toward the mark for the high calling of Jesus Christ. What is it to press? When we talk about pressing towards the mark, what does that mean? Even when you're tired, right? I mean, y'all can look at me and tell I am not in tip-top marathon condition, but I can still run, and I do sometimes when other things don't prevent me from doing it. But when I was younger, I can remember throwing up the last hundred yards or so of a, 
of a PT test because I wanted to be in the top and I was dehydrated, but I kept pushing and I was pushing and pushing and pushing to get there above. I didn't beat everybody, but I bet it beat everybody but four or five. Amen. You know, I was pretty, but that's pressing when you're tired and your body says, quit. You're pressing forward. And Paul said that from a jail cell. Look at what, look at what, or I, I won't ask you to look, just listen to what Paul faced in 2 Corinthians 11. All of us, go back to where I started, all of us, including the preacher, have pity parties sometimes about how bad we have it. But I gotta tell you, I don't think I've had anything in comparison to what Paul had. Listen to what he said. Five times received I 40 strikes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep to. He's just bobbing around out there like a corpse in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. You know, I, I, was, I, I kind of had a pity party by getting my pocket picked. And, and, and uh, uh, a preacher friend of mine checked on me yesterday, and I said, well, it's kind of been a rough week. It started with me getting pickpocketed the other Saturday. And he said, well, I got robbed at gunpoint while knocking on doors. It happens, son, but Jesus is still all we need. Amen. So you, know, you see what I'm saying? Uh, <clears throat> In, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting. So hunger and thirst, he didn't have a choice in the matter. In fasting, he did have a choice in the matter. In cold and nakedness, and besides those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. What does the word perils mean? If we say something is perilous, what's that mean? Dangerous. Mm -hmm. Dangerous. So he's, he's faced way more danger than I, than I know I faced anyway. And yet in Acts chapter 20, which is effectively the end of his ministry outside of jail cell, he said, none of these things moved me. Hebrews 6, 1. We don't have to wander to dwell in the Canaan land. Let, let me read Hebrews 6, 1 to you real quick. I'm still working on the reasons for faintness. I'm going to give you three reasons for faintness in just a second. Therefore, leaving the principles of, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Look, <clears throat> we don't have to I may have written that text down wrong. We don't. We we can dwell. What is Canaan land? If we listen to all the old Southern gospel songs about Canaan, what is Canaan? According to all the old Southern gospel songs we listen to, what's Canaan? Like, like heaven, but it's not heaven. Why is it not heaven? When I get when you get to heaven, Jeremy, are there going to be enemies there that you have to take your sword and run them out? But there were enemies in Canaan land. There were still battles to be fought. Canaan in the Old Testament is a picture of the victorious Christian life in the New Testament. You still have battles to fight. And we can dwell in Canaan land. Victory here. But what are the, the, the reasons for faintness? We've established the reality. Well, sometimes there's self-inflicted weariness. In other words, we do it to ourselves. Uh, sometimes, Baptists are real good at this, and there's some other groups I know who are just as good at this as us, is we want to give Satan credit for what we do to ourselves. I'm reminded of when I was a boy, there was a fellow, and it's become a regular part of society now, but it was just comedy in the 70s. There was a fellow who dressed up like a girl, and he called himself Cliff Wilson, and he would say, the devil made me do it. He had a certain way that he said that. No matter what he was joking about, he said, the devil made me do it. Well, he, he died back in the 90s. But the point is that too often we give Satan credit when we just put something before our eye gate that we shouldn't have. Put something before our ear gate that we shouldn't have. Uh, we give Satan credit when a lot of things are, are our fault. What's the secret? 
to running the race with patience and not fainting. It's where your eyes are. Even today when I'm running, if I start to get tired and want to quit, my eyes instantly go to the ground right in front of me. But if I decide, no, I can't quit yet, I've got to put my eyes out there. Even if I can't see the finish line, I've got to see something out in the distance. Where are our eyes supposed to be when we're running the race that's set before us? The secret to finishing that race is in the text there in Hebrews 12. It says in verse number 3, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Otis, I try to tell you, follow me even as I follow Christ. But the fact is, I'm human and I may not follow Christ always. I may get out of my, my flesh may inflict weariness upon me, right? But if I got my eyes on Jesus, you see, people will let you down, Cecile. But Christ never will. We have to keep our eyes on Christ. I've heard pastors, I think pastoring today is an awful lot like, like uh, coaching. You know, I, I have a few different friends who've gotten out of coaching, even though that's, they went to college specifically to become a coach. Do you know why? Can you guess why people are getting out of a profession that they went to college specifically because that was their dream to be in that profession? Because they got tired. Yeah, but the tiredness, what what brought the tiredness? They took their eyes off the goal. Okay. That's a true statement. Now, not everybody in here is from the South, but right now, the winning is coach, coaching ball right now, coaching football, which is what I like, is who? Who's the winning is coaching football today? Anybody know? Nick Saban. He's at the University of Alabama. You can like him, you can hate him, but he's the best right now. He's got more championship rings than anybody else. He has won more championships at Alabama than any previous coach. <coughs> And yet, when they lose a the game, you got fans calling for his job. Two coaches I know in baseball, which is another sport I like, got out of it because you can always Google and find somebody who wants the coach to do it, who says the coach should do it the way you think he should do it, but they're not the coach. That's, it's a trying thing. But pastors can get tired in the way as well, right? What, what do we need to do? Whether it's me that's getting tired and it's my fault or it's you that's getting tired and it's your fault, what, what is the answer to self-inflicted weariness? Well, I'm going to give it to you. And I've preached through the text before, so I'm not going to tell you anything. I haven't previously told you. If somebody has a brand new thing, we better check them out. They, they might be mistaken. But the scripture says in Philippians chapter number 4. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So the first thing we need to do is pray about it. Second thing. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. These things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. This is Paul writing. Where is he writing that from? A jail cell waiting to have his head chopped off. And he can be content. And if we look up here at the recipe for us being content, it's a proper prayer life and a proper perspective. 
we can always find something to look at, to pick about what's going on. But let's try to look at the things where something good is happening and God is being glorified. So, self-inflicted weariness, satanic influence. But some people want to say that Satan isn't real. And uh, I think a lot of times, uh, even Christians today don't give Satan his due credit. But the scripture says, remember I started with casting all your care upon him way back when I was praying. The next verse after casting all of our care upon Christ says, be sober. That means be serious minded. Be vigilant. Be watching. Because your adversary, the, do the, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 6 talks about putting on the whole armor. You don't need an armor if you're not in a battle. But when we're in a battle against ourselves, yes. Against society, yes. But against Satan, who is real, yes. We need the armor. What is our shield? It's the spirit. What is our sword? The word of God. We need these things. A lot of us, uh, sometimes even the pastor can get to the point where you have to put on your whole armor and you're just running around with your helmet of salvation and wondering why you're getting tired because you don't have anything to block it off. If I'm not if I'm not being filled with the Spirit, you know, that's not something that happens one time and you're just filled with the Spirit the rest of your life. You can be filled with the Spirit this morning and let somebody make you mad walking out the door and, and not be full of the Spirit the rest of the week. First Timothy 6, 12. Let me read that to you. I went the wrong way. No, I didn't. I just went too far. First Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and professed a good profession before many witnesses. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 2, 11. We're talking about satanic influence. It's real. It's a real reason that some of us get tired in the fight. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Uh, what he has always done is point to other people or twist the word of God. That's, the two, that's two of his, it may not be his only tools, but that's two tools that he uses. And I'm not going to say he uses them good, but he is... He is diligent in the use of those two, those two tools. He's putting our eyes on somebody else and what they ought to do differently. I heard a loud voice. Oh, in I'm not going to read you the whole verse, but basically in Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 12, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. When we start looking at our brothers and sisters in Christ and start thinking, well, she needs to do such and such different. He needs to do this and such different. We need to remember that it could be Satan that's, that's dividing us by putting our mind on those things. All right? 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and we're going to try to move on to the, to the next part. The next reason for faintness. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What is the word angel? There's another way that that word could be. Angel of light. What is an angel? An angel, an angel is, to use the words of scripture, an angel is a what? Messenger of God. It's one thing. A minister of light. Uh, uh, a ministering spirit. And so basically Satan can make himself look like a minister. He can make, we can, well, there's two different applications to that. Yes, he can make himself look like the angel who is the minister of God. But I believe based on what some people we hear in society today preach, that's so far removed from scripture that he can make himself look like a pastor. Satan can attack. Self can attack. But you can get the, there's one more reason for faintness. Well, what's the good news? E even in the middle of a satanic attack, even in the middle of us having pity parties and inflicting ourselves with weariness, what's the good news of that kind of weariness? Whether it be from Satan or self, what's the good news? If Satan is attacking the church, what's the good news, Otis? Call for the commander to leave. 
<laughs> we can't call the commander for relief. But what I have always seen in 26 years of ministry is when Satan is attacking, that's because he knows God is working and he's trying to make us quench the spirit. When Satan is attacking, it's generally right before God does something magnificent. So we need to press through this. The other thing, which I think it's Sunday school on Sunday morning, and this I thought about preaching this on a Wednesday night. It's very true, I think, for the Sunday morning, Sunday school this morning, or for a Wednesday night service. For the spine of the church, there's service-affected weariness. Just serving God can wear you down. You look in the scriptures. <laughs> no one's trying to say that you as the church or I as the pastor is weak. And yet, we can become weary serving God. You, you don't you don't think so? What about Noah? No, I won't go through it because it's a horrid event. But Noah got weak right after a great victory. Right after God saved him, his wife, their children, and their spouses, Noah got drunk. And his son sinned against him. Hmm. Abraham, in a couple of different occasions, allowed his faith to waver, and he lied rather than trusting God. Don't you think God's people can get weak in the middle of serving him? Moses got weak in the service of the Lord, and he struck the rock out of anger as opposed to speaking to the rock as God told him to do. Samuel got weak. We know of no particular sin necessarily in Samuel's life, but what we do know is when the people wanted a king, he took it personally rather than having righteous indignation of them offending a holy God. Samuel got weak. Elijah got weak. He went hid under the juniper tree after a major victory. Peter got weak and denied Christ. He got weak again, and he went fishing. Don't you see? Don't see this as an attack, but an encouragement for us to be as close to God as possible. Look back at Gideon here. We'll look at some of the verses, but a lot of this you will remember from, because you've heard the story your whole life. Gideon had just seen the enemy run away, right? He went down. God, God, Gideon was weak. And I'm glad God can use weak people. Gideon asked for a sign. God gave him the sign. Wet Sham, right? A wet chamois. A wet sheepskin. I'm going to get to the word in a minute. A dry sheepskin. Before that, he asked for a sign, and God had fire come down and eat up some kind of little sacrifice he made. It's three different signs. And then when they walked down for the actual battle, he overheard the enemy say, well, I had a dream last night, and a barley cake just came rolling down the hill, then broke up our camp, and it can't be anybody but the sword of Lord and the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And when they broke the pitchers and blew the trumpets, the enemy ran away. And yet Gideon is faint in pursuing them. So we sit here, we talk about the reasons for faintness, uh, mm. the, the reality of faintness, the reason of faintness. Uh, we can find reasons in which to be discouraged. But if we're honest with ourselves and with the Lord, God's working in our church. Look at Gideon's situation. The things that will weary you. The selection process. How many people came out to fight with Gideon? I'm going to answer that for you because some people get confused with the numbers there. 32,000 people came out to fight. And God said, if they're scared, let them go home. And two-thirds walked away. 22,000 people walked away. And God said, hey, it's still too many because if I bless them, and give them the victory, they're going to say, we were 10,000, but we took on an innumerable enemy and won. He said, it's too many. I won't get the glory. They will. So you got people. 
They go down to the creek. And they drink like this. But why are they drinking like this? Keep your eyes because the you. enemy's right over there. And they're without number. The other ones, Cecile, they drink like this. They just lay down and suck that water straight out the tree. That's foolish. And that's arrogant. That is not bravery. Some might, might, somebody might look at those and go, oh, look how brave they are. They're not even concerned about the enemy. If you're not concerned about the enemy, whether it's yourself, Satan, or society, that's not bravery. That's foolishness. There are ministers out of the ministry today because they didn't worry about Satan and society. And they allowed Satan and society to get in their head and they sinned to sin that didn't take away their salvation. No, but it took away their ministry. Bravery is being scared to death and saddling up anyway, one man said. Okay, they're, they're concerned about the enemy, but they're there to fight. So God sent the 9,700 that were too arrogant to be concerned about the enemy home, and he chose the 300. There are churches all over this country. There are two more in this city where we are. But not everybody's preaching the truth to see now, I'm not saying we're the only ones, but I'm saying we stand out from most everybody else. And that can be tiresome because everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be the center of attention. That's not always God's plan. The selection process can weary you. The statement can weary you. They had, if you look in chapter 7 of, of, of Judges, in verses 18 and 20, they had a dictated statement. They had a, I got to come in for a landing. Uh, they had a dictated statement, but I, I'm going to finish this, amen, if we start the 11 o'clock a little late. I think we all need to hear it. In verses 18 and 20, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 20, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. A lot of people are trying to change the message today, but salvation hasn't changed. Sinners haven't changed, except maybe they're more debauched today than, than we remember. But I think that that fall, maybe not on your and my shoulders specifically, but I think that falls squarely on the church because the church is not affecting the world like it once did. Okay. Separation and sanctification haven't changed. Parents have gotten weary. Parents want to change the message. This Bible still works. Biblical discipline still works. Some people say, we were laughing about it a couple of days ago. Some people say we pick our battles. And that's, a, that's really a wise thing, okay? But I've noticed some people who say they pick their battles, and I scratch my head and go, well, what are they battling? I don't see them battling anything, right? we got to follow the Lord's word. So the selection process will weary you. Sometimes just standing by the word will weary you, a dictated statement. And making a biblical stand will weary you. Judges 7, 21. Look in verse 21. Right. They stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran yes. and cried and fled. Making a stand can be weary. So we stand on the Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the victorious life of Christ. We believe in the vicarious okay. death of Christ. We believe in the visible and bodily resurrection, a visible return. We believe in the autonomy of the local church. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. You don't have to come kiss my ring and ask God to forgive you. We believe in two ordinances, back, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper, individual soul liberty. We can't be saved for other people. They can't be saved for us. We believe in a saved church membership. We believe in two offices, the pastor, also called deacon, um, excuse me, bishop, and sometimes called elder and deacon. We believe in separation of church and state. So, the selection process, the statement, the stand, and sometimes the success of others. Can be really you see somebody having a little success and, and we get jealous. And I'll give you this and I'm going to close. Resolve in the midst of faintness. What does it mean 
things are resolved. We sing this song, I am resolved no longer to linger. What does the word resolve mean? I couldn't hear you. Resolute. Resolute. What, what does it mean to be resolute? Right? It means to determine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward even though I'm tired. I'm going to go forward even though I'm in the middle of a battle. I'm going to press forward. Faint, yet pursuing. Hopefully it was Gideon who said, hey, let's press on. But somebody needs to say, let's press on. We're going to have battles. We're going to have difficulties. But the Lord is on our side. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for those who came out for the Sunday school lesson.